Welcome back to Final Residence TV and episode number one of my new series called Van Halen Stories. I have an awesome guest with me tonight, or today, uh, Mike Simmons, who is the manager over at Blackbird Studios Rental Department. And if you guys know anything about Blackbird Studios, you know it's one of the greatest studios in the world. And definitely, I would say, now you, you could correct me on this, but probably the biggest rental department in the world. Is that right? I would say yes. I'm not super sure what all pro audio rental goes on across the seas. Right. But I know definitely in the United States, probably in the world, probably the biggest inventory for sure. And so tell people what you, you know, what you can rent to them if they would like to pick something up to rent. You could rent uh, an, a vintage Telefunken 251 tube mic. You could rent a vintage Neve 1073 preamp in a powered rack with a, I don't know, maybe like a LA-2A or a tube tech compressor. Those are always, <clears throat> I get a lot of calls for those kind of vocal chains. Mm -hmm. Any kind of tube mic, we're going to have it. All the old ones and quite a few of the new ones. Um, Pro Tools rigs, interfaces like Pro Tools HDX rigs or little laptop rigs with uh, like a Antelope Orion. Have you ever seen one of those? Those yeah, things yeah. sound great. Yeah. <laughs> you can get like 32 IO across uh, USB or Thunderbolt into a laptop and sounds killer. Wow. Um, we, we do a lot of, we do some instrument rentals, mostly for studio recording, not a whole lot of live, but we do, we will do backline every now and then but most of our backline stuff is mostly for studio rentals. Right. So amp, um, amps, you got plenty of amps, I know. Oh, a lot of amps. And I actually, we just did a, a Dio tribute show a couple of weeks back. Oh, and that's awesome. We ended up doing, Blackbird did the backline for that just to make it easy. Cool. And, and uh, there's, a, you great. know, there's also the, uh, I want to give Karma a, a shout out for her, her school there that you guys do. Tell, tell people about that school a little bit. The Blackbird Academy, they have, um, I think, three semesters a year, and we do, um, we have a live school and, a, and stu an audio recording school, and uh, it is probably, oh, it's starting to rain here. I was wondering what that noise was. <laughs> probably um, a lot different than what a lot of the audio schools are. It's a lot of hands-on. It's a lot of mentorship. It's a lot of uh, working with people who have done the deal, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, you know, I'm not going to start naming off a bunch of names, but we have all kinds of uh, super pro audio engineers and producers and artists come in and uh, do presentations with the class. They also do hands-on in the studio, it, actually part of their, there is a classroom and they all have a station with a, with the uh, UA Apollo and Pro Tools, but they also bounce around in the big tracking rooms in the smaller overdub rooms and get hands-on experience through the whole time they're there. I actually do uh, a class for electric guitar and backline for each class every semester. I spend a day with them and just share my experience because, you know, Right. You know how it is. We've been doing this a long time, man. We want to keep, we want the kids to know the right way to do it. That's right. That's right. And there is a live, a live version still, right, as well. Oh, yeah. The live school is great. It's and the uh, employment after graduation. Um, I don't know if we're the, the highest, but I know we place a lot of our students um, get really good gigs in the industry and uh, people love them. Good way to get started, get get your career. Oh, yeah. Music. Yeah, man. That hands-on makes all the difference. Because that mentorship, and that's kind of what, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on, too, is just to, to you know, share your experiences. And we're going to share our Van Halen experiences today. But, you know, oh, so we, we could talk about how that affected us as we, as we went on in our career. I mean, for me, that was the genesis of my whole career was seeing Van me too. and excited by them. I, yeah, I knew that about you. And so the genesis of this for you was this this beginning show you saw in 1978. Yes. Um, I have it as November 9th, 1978. Correct. Okay. 
You saw the first show of two shows, is that right? Yes. Did you see the correct. second? Did you see the second show? I did. Because you got a free and, um, to that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that first show is the one. That's the one I always focus on. Because yeah. the second show, I was basically just like tr watching everything, trying to pick up anything that I could. Right. But the first one was just like a nuclear blast. Right. It was like what I would, the same kind of feeling if you were seeing a nuclear blast in person, you know, back in the 50s when they did it or something. It's just like life changing, man. Right. Well, let's set, let's set the show up. It's it's 1978. And you have this unique story that you have a, a blog on, which I'm going to share in the uh, the notes on this. Okay, show, great. So people can read it, which is fantastic, man. The way that you you articulate that in that is just, man, it's one of the best written things I've ever. Seen. Plus all your Thanks, plus all your other blogs are incredible. So you coming have, from the heart. I'm yeah. telling you, man. Check check out those blogs when y'all get done watching this video and, and read through some of the different shows that Mike's uh, put together there for you because it's just. It, it, really impressive man so thanks man this show is famous for for ozzy not showing up uh, ozzy apparently was out partying too much with david lee roth and ended up going into the wrong hotel room and fell asleep nobody could find him and then you get an extra bit of show from this because oh, yeah. plays a little longer yep so let's just start out with going to the show what happened i know this is something with your work that you were doing and and yeah give me a little background up to that point you know you said this in the blog but what you knew about van halen before this point and then to the show very little so the first time i heard van halen i was actually in my van and something had happened and we were i just remember i was in the parking lot of mcgavick high school where i went to high school but it was uh during the summer i was either in summer school um something was going on and my buddy was with me he had to go back in so i turned the radio on in the van and the radio announcer happened to announce van halen this is a new song from van halen mm -hmm. and i must have been see nashville at the time wasn't really on the cutting edge of new music you know and staying of, of rock music yeah definitely right so in the might have been an AM station. It could have been an FM. I don't know, but it was running with the devil. Now, if I had heard um, the first single, which was the Kinks cover, yeah, you, uh, you really got me. That would have definitely grabbed my attention, but that's not what I heard first. I heard running with the devil first, right. and I was a Richie Blackmore freak. By that time, I'd been working on my playing. I'd been playing for just a couple years. And uh, it was all Richie, you know, and I was starting to really start picking up on playing some lead and was just learning everything from his records from mostly Machine Head, Made in Japan and Made in Europe. And I love the live records. So when I heard Running with the Devil, I was just the solo and it's just one of his melodic takes, you know, it's not really one of his burning, like landscape changing solos that are on that record. Right. So I heard it and I was like, eh, you know, I could take it or leave it. And I loved Ronnie James Dio as a singer, you know, and I was totally, yeah, Rainbow was the other live album I was into at the time. Mm -hmm. So, and David Lee Roth, it just, it didn't grab me. Right. So I was like, okay, Van Halen, whatever, you know, and uh, that was it. I just kind of followed it away as not Deep Purple, not Rainbow, not my thing. Mm -hmm. right. Fast forward, I'm working at this print shop in downtown Nashville and I'd been to a few concerts by then. My first concert was Kiss in 1976, Destroyer Tour. Awesome. That was a good first concert, <laughs> right, right. man. Hard yeah. to beat. <laughs> yep. And then uh, I'd seen the Outlaws. Um, I think my dad took me to see ELP, mm -hmm. Emerson, Lake and Palmer with the symphony. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe the Eagles. I, I remember seeing the Eagles on a Hotel California tour too but it wasn't really my thing. I went with my dad, both of those. Yeah. yeah. So Black Sabbath is coming to town and um, I, I was working at this print shop. I, I didn't really have money for a ticket. I didn't know what I was going to, whether I'd be able to go or not. I, I wanted to go and my boss gave me a ticket and uh, Bobby. <laughs> and he's like, man, you got to check out this band Van Halen. I was like, I'll, I'll go for Sabbath, you know, the Van Halen thing just didn't click. 
Right, right. So I get the ticket. I'm by myself. I go walking down the alleys. It's like a pretty, it's a wet kind of November, kind of cold night in Nashville. And uh, I think I smoked a little something maybe <laughs> on the way. So you're going down, um, a, you're going down a municipal auditorium. Yeah, it's about a four or five block walk. Okay. And um, so I get in, I'm like, okay. It was pretty easy to get up close up front um, because it was early. So I was like, yeah, I'm just going to get up as close as I can up front. And I was kind of on the left side. And um, the lights go down. My favorite part of concerts, you know, it's just like, all right, see what's going on here. Right. And uh, they announce Van Halen. And f- the very first note of the guitar, I was like, what? <laughs> it was super loud, man. Just super loud. Even for, for an opening band, um, you know, we know later that the record label was kind of pushing them. So I'm sure they were giving them a lot of sound, a lot of, you know, it, it just immediately they, they start into On Fire. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> and I'm immediately drawn to Edward because just his energy on the stage was just, you know, I'm a guitar player. I love guitar playing. He hadn't even played the lead yet. I'm already going, who is this guy? And then he, he does that little harmonic thing. I'm like, what the fuck is that? So immediately I'm just riveted. And they start going through the song. And the first thing I noticed is like, man, I've never heard a guitar that sounds like that. It had this cool curve on it, which I now know was the phase 90. Right, right. And, uh, and he would punch the flanger in and out. And I was just like, man, he was just so on it. Everything was so dialed in. And the tone was so full. Right. And uh, I just never heard anything like that before, much less seen anything like that before. Right. He was playing the black and white Strat. Right. And he had on like just a white shirt kind of open with some bell bottoms. I think Capizio shoes. Uh-huh. I bought some Capizios not too long after that. <laughs> That's my right. thing for a while. Right. And um, then the solo. And right. I was just like that ascending you know, those legato runs, palm muted, everything. It was just like, and they were moving. That song moves. And it was just like, holy shit. So immediately, first song is blowing me away. And the energy coming off the stage with Dave jumping around. Michael Anthony was cool, man, over there. You know, man's man doing his thing. Mm-hmm. And Alex back there just pounding the hell out of the drums. And they were just locked in. They just took you by the throat and it didn't let go, man. One thing I have to remind people of is you never, back then, we never saw these things on TV. There wasn't any. No. There was no preconceived notion of what you were going to see. There was no warning. It was like as, as if yeah. you, were, you had no clue and they just dropped you in front of Van Dude, Hilton. I'm literally <laughs> getting the goosebumps right now. Right. Because that's what happened then. Right, um, right. Thinking about it. Yeah, we had, you know, no, we had no way to know. <laughs> so I immediately start, like, pushing through the crowd, and I'm moving over towards Edward's side and trying to get up closer because not only am I just freaking out on what's going on with him, um, I want to see what's he got going on up there. You know? Right, right, right. It was hard to see. I couldn't really see the pedals, but, man, the big bomb was back there. Right. And that night they didn't have the double stack, but he had, the, like, four – wood 412s on the floor just lying across and they were like all the tolex was ripped off and they were just like that dirty like worn in wood it just looked cool man and they were it in, sounded amazing they were in your face too because they're yeah. down at the bottom and you're in front <laughs> right you're getting it right in the face <laughs> <laughs> yeah awesome so when they played running with the devil all of a sudden it was cool because now i had a little bit of perspective after seeing that first lead in uh, on fire yeah and i'm just man i'm like what is going on here and you know i'm just getting excited i'm getting pumped up then atomic punk mm-hmm. that was just like what is that that intro man and i saw what he was doing with his hand 
Right. But I didn't know how he was getting the sound and how you could get a sound like that out of a guitar. Right. You know, and then that solo, well, that whole song, the groove, the the structure, just, you know, mm-hmm. I love that song, man. We played that song in a Van Halen tribute not too long. That song is probably the most fun song for it me is. to play. Did you play it? I played it you last played night. It with yours? I played it last night. Yeah, baby. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's what? so fun. You know what's funny about that song is it's sort of for us a deep cut, you know. I think yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I should say for most people a deep cut. Oh but, yeah. But it, it goes over am- amazingly well with people who aren't as familiar. Yeah. It because fun. it's because it's just great. There, everything about it is great. Yeah. And the anybody that's ever t- said, Oh man, Van Halen ain't metal, it's like, what are you talking about? You know. Listen to that song. Right, right. Yeah, he invented that sound. So right, right. that all these metal bands use now. They were more than metal, of course, but they definitely yeah, they had kings of it too. I tell you, man, you know, before that point dude, so th- Yeah, before that point, you know, they they're I mean, we have to kind of set that up that you know, this was the era of disco, this is was, you know, the Bee Gees and, and Greece and all that had just happened. So this was not like in vogue really yet. We didn't, I mean, the metal mm-hmm. thing was like, there was like that thing between the seventies version of, you know, Sabbath and all those things before that you, you were into. Right. And this hit. Deep and then purple Zeppelin. Else, yeah. And then something else started. So keep going. Absolutely. But yeah, so all these things are rolling around, you know, I didn't even know the word metal then it, metal wasn't really a thing yet. Right. This was just awesome. Right. <laughs> That's right, all it right, was. Right, right, right. So the show rolls on, man, and all these those great songs off the first album, they're just mowing them down one by one. Right. And I'm just getting more and more like my my wheels are spinning and I'm watching him. And um uh, Ice Cream Man and maybe a couple of other songs I started seeing him doing the tapping. I was like, What? What was that? <laughs> what how what's he doing? But you weren't getting the full um, meal deal yet. Right, right. It was still to come. Right. And like the life changing moment was I'm standing there. I'm in my work clothes, man. I've got like a name tag on. I'm in my printing thing with a hat and just <clears throat> jaw open as eruption starts. And everything's just the whole crowd was like silent dude and they had a spotlight on him burning white it was just him and the guitar and he starts into that and um he's not only playing he he played it kind of like it was on the record but he started ad-libbing a bunch of like dive bombs and like feedback taking what hendrix used to do with the feedback thing and just taking it to the stratosphere right. or um you ever listen to Scorpions Tokyo tapes? Sure, sure. What Roth would do with his right. bar? Eddie was doing all that stuff, just the huge, <laughs> and the whole place is shaking. Wow. Okay, and the lights are kind of flashing on and off. Then he comes front and center. There's that pause, and then he starts into the the last section of it, man. And when he flows, starts flowing into the finger tapping part, man, the. I looked around just briefly and everybody was just like, what? <laughs> what is this? And then I was just laser focused on him as he finished it off, man. <laughs> I mean, you're, dude, you know what? You get emotional about it, man. You're one of the few people I know that was there when that, that you know, that he hit the scene like that. And you know? I was 16. Yeah, right. So it was just like, yeah, man. You know, everybody's so jaded today, and I get it. You know, we've seen everything. There's six-year-old guitar players that blow my ass away on YouTube. What are you going to (laughs) do? They don't really know how to touch their instrument yet, though, but they'll get there. You know, at least they're playing. I love it. Sure. But, yeah, this was, you know, you just got to understand that this was the closest thing I think anybody had seen to this probably was Hendrix. And there was probably other few players out there that were doing super fast stuff, Al Demiola and even Roth, you know, Uli Roth from the Scorpions, but I'd never heard any of that stuff yet. Yeah, right. So, so and uh, man, his his speed picking, the finger tapping, his sound, the um, the way that he incorporated the effects in his sound, 
and just the way he looked mm -hmm. and the absolute joy that you could see on his face as he was playing, man. I'm so grateful I got to be there. Right, right. And then it just kept going. You know, they were playing and playing, you know, Ice Cream Man. I was just like, what? Holy shit, man. Another just solo after solo, just, just making me think. Yeah. Can you I mean, I'm, I can imagine you watching that Ice Cream Man stretch for the first time. Oh, in life, right? all his, his hand just looked like an alien thing, man. Right, right. And, um, you know, a lot of players were probably super intimidated by that or like, I'm hanging it up after this. How can you do anything more with the guitar? But to me, I was too naive and I was young enough to just go, no, you know, now I've got another goal to work towards, sure. you know, sure. but, um, those, this is all stuff that was running through my head, but they just kept playing. I was moving closer and closer to the stage, you know, and, um, I'm the one. <sighs> yeah. Right. Man. <laughs> Today that's still like, that's I know I can't right. play that song. I've everybody, tried that. Everybody yeah. like, if you can that play Joshua that. kid can play it. He's awesome. Yeah. But yeah, he is good. I can't, I never can't get that groove. So, but anyway, and then they do the vocal thing in the middle. And uh, during that, after the last solo in that song, Eddie's whammy bar broke off his guitar. Oh. And okay. uh, he's just holding it and looking at Roth, and they're laughing at each other. And he's just like, whatever, you know. <laughs> um, he kept playing it, and he was he would just use his hand on the – he would pull the, the fulcrum part of the tremolo with his hand and do bar stuff. So he must have had it set pretty loose, man. I think he played pretty light strings. He did. I think it was like nine to forty. Yeah. Or maybe so. Or he might have even been pushing it from underneath. Who knows? But he was still doing bar stuff. Yeah. And then you know they they kept going. They did a couple songs that weren't on the first record. I didn't even know what was on the first record, so it was all kick ass to me. Right. But I know they played Dead or Alive. Um, played a couple other ones that were on on the second record. Right, because backstage at that very moment, they're trying to decide whether to cancel the show. Yeah, they kept stopping, and then they would look over like, what are we doing? And there was people signaling to him from the side. Nobody knew what was going on, and then Eddie would disappear or come back out, and he'd whisper something to Roth, and they'd go into another one. And uh, I guess they finally you know, got to their limit of songs and what they could do or what they were willing to do. Right. And... Um, but he did switch. Hang on, let me grab this. Go ahead. <laughs> right? The shark! He did switch to the shark baby. Right. Um, for the last couple of songs. Or maybe, you know what? It might have been after Eruption he switched to it, and then he switched back. Right. But you um, had to get tuned up. <laughs> you got one of these, yeah. Yeah, right and, there. Uh, Yep, for sentimental value, I got one of these this year. You know what? It ended up being a really good guitar. All right, we talked about that. We talked about yeah. it when I had one and you, you asked me what I thought. Yeah, I yeah. played a lot, man. I've recorded with it and everything. I love the pickups. I love the that really focused mid range this guitar has. It's, it's, a, it's a lot. It's a lot darker than I expected to be. Yeah, totally. Tone wise, yeah. Because he had, you know, there was all that talk about how when he cut the piece out of it that it was bright and tinny or whatever. And yeah, I, this guitar doesn't do that. But no, nah, I think different wood, different, yeah, everything. But just having it and uh, the look of it, it's just. Um, well, it's, it's such a memorable. Th you saw it, man. Yeah, you saw and, it. Uh, I remember seeing that when he was playing. You really got me, and I'm like, just everything that happened was like new and exciting and perfect and just kick ass. Right. So they were my band, you know, I didn't even care. Finally they stopped and man, everybody was just like freaking out, just wanting more and more. And, you know, they did two or three encores. Then the lights came up and there was just this buzz going on. And I'm talking to a guy next to me. He's like, can you believe that? I'm like, holy shit. And, um, then this guy comes out, this poor guy comes out and makes the announcement that I'm sorry, Black Sabbath this is not going to be able to play tonight. And as soon as those words came out of his mouth, he was just showered with cups. I don't, man, I don't know where people got all this stuff they were throwing at him. He went running off the stage. 
people started raising hell. Not me. I was just like, you know what? I don't even care. <laughs> right. I walked, I walked back to the back part, back behind the soundboard and uh, just stood there for a second, freaking out on what I'd just seen. And my wheels were spinning. You know, I'm like, I got to get this record. Uh, you know, that was my next mission to get this record. And then the few things that I saw start figuring out what he was doing, if there was any way you could figure it out. Yeah. So inspired, man. Yeah, you know, back then, again, too, that because we didn't see anybody play these things live on, on TV or even the videos, we didn't have many, many videos at the time, especially at that point, 78. Yeah, maybe Don Kirshner's rock concert, Midnight yeah. Special or whatever, but, man, that, it, that it, was it, few it, and far between. Right, so the, the, I, the, the thing was, we didn't, other than the record, we never saw how he played anything. No, unless you were there live, and you had right. to be, you had to be close up. So, dude, that, I still I couldn't figure out the atomic punk uh, palm white thing forever. Right. Took a right. long time. You know, one thing. So I don't want to get too far ahead, but I, I saw him again a couple of years later, and I did figure out how he did the um, the roll. You know, in the harmonic right. where you move your hand up and down. I caught that by accident right. and finger tapping. Right. That was the that was the first thing I got from that first night. You know, the next day I was working on a very crude uh, rendition of some finger tapping stuff. Yeah, it's amazing that you know you think about how we would pick that stuff up back then. I mean, that thing, the, the tapping, the way I felt about it when I first heard about it and saw it or heard it on a record was it was like magic, man. It was some yeah. sort of magical. It's just, oh, I, man. We just after I got the record, because my dad was into guitar music. He liked the Eagles and the Beatles and all that kind of stuff. But when I played him Eruption, he he said this to me, and I, you know, this is not a lot of people I think said this to other guys <laughs> because that's a synthesizer, Mike. That's not a guitar. I'm like, Dad, I saw him do it. He goes, Well, then he had something on the side of the stage or something. He's like, A guitar doesn't make that sound. <laughs> Right. I was like, okay, Dad, whatever, bro. <laughs> I saw it. Yeah. Right. More than once, he played in a couple of songs. <laughs> that is so crazy, man. That people. Yeah. We just, I mean, the whole world. You just it. If you did, if you weren't there like you were, you just don't know how how much impact he had. It was so great, man. It was just so, you know he became my number one guy after that and still right. is to this day. You know, I still, I love Richie Blackmore, but this was just something um, to really shoot for, to set some goals in my plan. And I really started getting busy with practicing and working and guitar just became everything after that. Yeah. I it was mean, already, I was already eating up with it, but after that I started on a mission. Right. Yeah, I think yeah. that you know he, that Eddie had that effect on millions of people. He did. I don't think that people realize that, he, that he, not only as a guitar player, but as a, somebody who gave you inspiration to do something with your life. That, like I always say, you know, he he not only gave me the inspiration to play, but he gave me a purpose to do something I love to do. Yeah. You know. And yeah, that, and and you know, the interviews that he would do in Guitar World. Um, you know, I would eat all that stuff up and his take on doing your own thing. Don't try to be me. You know, it's great to have, you know, somebody to be inspiration and sure. you, you can learn from copying somebody, but then take that and do something, do your own thing with it. Sure. You sure. Know? Yeah. And I've always taken that to heart. Sure. I think you everybody, know. you know, that, that watched what he did knew that, you know, that that was such a pure thing for him. Man, it was such a mystery how he got that guitar sound, though, back then. It took me many, many years to get something I was even happy with that yeah, came right. close, but still fell short. Can you imagine, you know, we all, during that period, we went through from, uh, you know, that point to the late 80s and 90s, there was that constant looking for that sound, you know. I think yeah. everything, uh, everybody did modifications and, and stuff like today with the Friedman amps and things like that. Um it all came from that. Yes, that, that totally. Sound, right? I totally. mean, this new amp you guys got in the other day, this Blackbird Edition amp that looks like a little bit of an 800. Yeah, the Heim, Jeff Heim's amp. What is that? 
it's very interesting what he's done. It's it's plexi based, you know, mm -hmm. but different from Friedman, especially in its low end and in its low mids. It's got two, um, basically two master volumes, a low and a high, mm -hmm. and you can. There's all kinds of blending you can do with that to dial in. You can get big, hairy, almost fuzz tones from that amp. Mm -hmm. Or you can dial in a brown sound, but you can also add um, more takes more out of your uh, gain stages with that. And then he also that was kind of based on his amp called the British Steel. Okay. And then he also put a, a boost in it at my request and did a couple other things in the circuit to make it like a one of a kind amp for Blackbird. The thing's a beast. You got to come up and play it sometime. Yeah, I will, man. I saw that picture that it does, like it's salivating Im immediately. <laughs> like, yeah, but this is all, it all goes back to this one dude's sound, you know, it's just this yeah, round dude. sound. Dude, there. I got, I got the twin sister for the studio. Mm -hmm. It's like basically a Freeman Dirty Shirley, a two channel version of it with a few extra switches. Mm -hmm. If you, um, pump all the extra gain stages on on that thing and then max the the gain mm -hmm. it it dials right into that eddy area man yeah right totally it's not it doesn't go much past that with more extra gain right but right. It, it goes right up into that yeah you I have a small, I have see a... you couldn't get that back in 78 79 oh, 80 oh no, no no you it was it was like uh, you know i have a jmp from 77 dude it's one of the best sounding amps i have still to this day yeah but you have to have some sort of boost in front to get yeah. anywhere near that. Everybody the was closest I got was uh, I had a Fender Super 6 Reverb and had a pullout knob that had an extra gain stage. I'm not sure. It was more like a clipping circuit, but it didn't even get close. It, it got me, and then I would put like a space echo in front of it, a rolling space echo, and jack the input. Yep. That started getting me a little bit of something that, you know, I could feel – like I was rocking out with, you know, but it wasn't until I got a, a JCM 800 in the early eighties. And then I would use a, a MXR micro boost in front of it or what it was it called? Micro amp. Micro amp. Yeah. And then I also used a copied Eddie's graphic EQ curve. I found a picture somewhere in one of the books with that, mm -hmm. that got close. Yeah. That, 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 yeah. Reverse smart those bass. early JCM 800s, the ones a few years after that weren't that good. Yeah, the 80s, early 80s, you said. That's yeah. what I, I've read that. So, it had the it had the clean channel on it too that nobody ever used. Right, the 2210. <laughs> yeah. All right, because there are a lot of people. Like a lot of people like Dave, uh, Dave Omato uses the 2210. Yeah. And he really likes it, but yeah, they. You were using tube screamers, super overdrives, yep. you know. And I tell you, one of the first experiences I had as a good kid with a with a distorted amp that I thought I went, oh, that's the sound that I'm looking for, was the Fender Super Champ, little bitty. Oh yeah, with the pull switch. Warren D. Martini. I know. <laughs> he yeah. Like, he used that on super the Super tone, man. Right. Yeah. Right. It was like so, eight, eight. Yeah. Eight. I wish I would have found one of those. I wish I would have stumbled upon one of those back then. I got the brown sound one time in our living room with an old Ampeg combo that I put a blanket over. <laughs> That's how dumb I was. Combo amp, blanket over the whole thing, turned it all the way up. There was the brown sound wow. for about two minutes. And then all this black smoke started coming out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have an Ampeg head here. It's a Lee Jackson designed one, you know, remember yep. what he did. And yeah, it's, it's pretty. It's a pretty. I got it for like really cheap, <laughs> like three fifty for it. But These I, mods are cool, man. Yeah, it was a pretty cool amp too. That was yeah. like early nineties. That was the problem. The problem with Lee's amps at that point when Ampeg released them was everybody was going the ADA rat route. Yeah, everybody was MP ones or the the Marshall preamps or with the power oh yeah amp. the preamps and the power amp. I went through a little phase with those too. Racks, racks never stuff. never was. As didn't speak to me as much. It sounded great. Yeah, yeah. But, well, it was um, the I think the thing with the ADA was the versatility of having switches. Yes. You know, we yeah. were all looking for switching, getting that delay on the on the leads and whatever, and having yeah. that option. Yeah, that was a big deal. See, back then, in the band we had in the eighties, um, I just went straight in. I had my micro amp and my EQ. I didn't use any delay, any effects. I played a Kramer Voyager. 
mm-hmm. white with a Floyd Rose. Yep. And just played loud as hell. <laughs> and just, you know, right. I was thinking, I just want to do everything I can just with my hands. I tell you we what, this those light hands. guy that always bitched at me. He's like, man, you need to get a delay. You need to get a chorus. You need to get some <laughs> flanger going. I yeah. thought I was some kind of purist or something, but, but you I'm know a what? delay addict now. Well, you know what, though? And to, to add credence to that, though, if you go back to my 77 back there in the back and you turn it on and you crank it, you don't mm-hmm. need anything else, dude. That amp sounds that good. Yep. <laughs> I mean, it, it is that ACDC classic, you know, powerful. Yeah. And the other thing about that amp that I noticed when I've taken it out over the years is that, and I've only taken it out and played it in like sound check or whatever, just because I wanted yeah. to hear it. But when you play that thing live, man, you always can hear it. Yeah. On stage. It's yeah. got that particular frequency cut that works. Yeah, man. And you I love hear. that. You don't ever have to look, you don't ever have to go, I can't really hear myself because it's too in a mid cut. Yep. <laughs> Those things were anything, but they had so much high end. <laughs> Holy shit, man. You you'd lose your freaking head if you got in front of one of those on the on your That's that really like good um compressed distortion too it's not it's not as distorted as you think oh yeah right 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 i find this too still when i'm recording i pull my gain way back when i'm recording double and guitars and stuff as compared to what i would do live it's just it's two two different things right sure i love a, a, a cleaner just punchier still distorted but that good power amp distortion man i tell you what channel sounds good is the uh, green channel on the EVH amp cranked. Oh, yeah. You yep. ever do that? Oh, yeah. It's very, yeah. very good. On my EVH, I live on the blue channel mostly. I rarely even use the red one. I just I, 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 I do about half gain, right. you know, and then really push the power section. Sounds good. Yeah, right. So let's go, to, let's go from uh, 78 to 80, which is your next experience with Van Halen Live. Yeah. Contrast the, the the two tours and what was different about it, and um, you know just how, how you felt that that time. So during that time in between, I became just a Van Halen nut, you know. And as soon as the second record came out, of course we got it. I'm starting to learn um, as many of the songs you know that I could play at the time. Ain't talking about love, of course. Running with the devil. Uh, I had a pretty good version of um, Feel Your Love Tonight. Mm-hmm. And did we, we do You Really Got Me? We probably did. I was in a cover band like everybody was, you know, when you're 17, 18, or whatever. Right. Um, and then Somebody Get Me a Doctor. I remember that one big time because that chord progression and just the way he played that, right, you just fun. feel like a dude. You just, once you get that, you're like, man, I'm doing it. I'm a man. <laughs> I tell you what, man, I did that song last night, and the way that he bounces off the C note when he does that, you know, yes. if you don't have that, yeah. you know, I've seen people do it online, and they try to do that with just the A. Nah. It is so hard to play that way, but the way he yeah. really plays it with the C, where he just kind of bounces yeah, off. Man. It took me a while just to find anybody playing it right. Dude, he has so many things like that. He was so unorthodox, you know, right. his boxes and his patterns. Once you get out, like once I got out of my pentatonic harmonic minor, you know, way of thinking on a lot of stuff, his shapes were just like, oh, wow, man, that's even easier. Yeah. You know, I'm making it too hard. Right, know? right, right. Yeah. That's the genius of him is, is I know. the unorthodox shaping. Yet, the, you know, when you kind of get into the, the, the mind of him and, and these patterns, you start going, oh, I can hear this all over the place. It's Absolutely. Like there is stuff. You hear those. That solo on On Fire is a classic example. It doesn't follow a melodic rule of one set scale. Right, but, man, right. all together, it's just badass. Right. That's the rule. It's right. That was, that was the rule for him. Yeah. yeah. You think, you think he's look when he's putting these songs together, he's, he's not thinking he's just doing it, you know? No, nah, he's Maybe, just rocking, man. He's just thinking this is bad so, ass. <laughs> Go <yeah>. ahead. So <laughs> during that time I'd gotten in a relationship with a girl. She broke my heart, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, um, finally, you know, they didn't come for the second album to Nashville. 
And back then, you couldn't get online. You couldn't find out where they were playing and drive somewhere to see them or something. I mean, you might have been able to, but I didn't have the the skills or the know-how to do anything like that. The only bands I ever saw when I was that age were bands that came to Nashville, came to Municipal Auditorium, and then later Starwood Amphitheater. But then the announcement for 1980 Invasion coincided with the release of Women and Children First. And I was uh, lucky enough to get that record and start burning in on some of those songs before the tour came through town. So I already, you know, I was just like, man, I hope they open up with Romeo Delight. That would be so badass. That was my favorite song for sure. And they did, right? That record. They They so did. (laughs) Right. But it was a whole different deal now, you know. As awesome as that first night was, and it's still probably the the pinnacle, you know, of memory. Right. But that show, it was a summer night. The crowd, there was just a buzz in the air when we showed up there, man, and um, probably drank a few beers. And you, I think the legal age was still eighteen in uh, Nashville at that time, and I was eighteen. Okay. But I probably shouldn't have been driving. I had a Volkswagen bus. Microbus, <laughs> and uh, how my parents ever let me have that car? I still to this day I don't know. We did so much bad stuff in that thing. But um, anyway, we got we all loaded up in the bus and drove down. And man, just the vibe going in. Everybody was happy. Van Halen was the band of the time, 1980. They could do no wrong. And uh, if the show wouldn't sold out, it was close. I know I got my tickets super early. Might have been sold out. And uh, I don't even remember who opened for them. Um, they had, I think, some really crappy band open for them or something. But the cool thing about that show was we go in and we're going to run right to the front, mm-hmm. me and my buddy Joey and a couple other guys. And um, they had chairs set up. Even though it was a general admission show, somebody had screwed up and they had chairs all on the floor. Mm. So everybody's kind of freaking out. So it was easy to get up front. We got like super close Mm -hmm. and we're just standing in front of these chairs and um, throughout whatever the opening band was or whatever, just kind of stood in those chairs. People were milling around. It was kind of a confusing thing. But um, then the lights go down for Van Halen. All of a sudden, you hear this helicopter sound. (laughs) Places rumbling. PA was huge and loud. (laughs) And then the stage was set in this kind of military motif. You've probably seen the pictures. Yeah. Um, And it wasn't the four cabinets on the floor and the bomb. It was just a wall of these custom speaker cabinets. And uh, this huge drum set with fire extinguishers on the side, you know, and there's, there was just, I don't know. It seemed like I remember like some kind of tank gun or something sticking out somewhere too. Mm -hmm. And danger, radiation, high explosives, all that kind of stuff's around. And then the spotlights are all going like this. And uh, you, you hear this thunderous, chord and the whole place just shook it was a guitar and then and you know tapping screams horses all that stuff dive bombs and uh they the announcer screaming van halen and um everything's just chaos the crowd is going nuts just ballistic and um really still couldn't see anything on stage. It was all a wash. And then spotlight, Eddie. He's just doing that by himself in the spotlight. And then the whole groove kicks in. And everything goes like white with lights everywhere. And Ross there just looking like Roth, you know. Girls are going crazy for him. All the dudes are like watching Eddie. And dude, the guitar was so loud. It's all you could hear. Wow. <laughs> the sound guy was probably just like having the, the time of his life. Right. And I remember in the first stop, he turns and points to the sound guy and he goes, 
turn me down. <laughs> so loud, you know, and, and um, I don't think he ever turned him down. I probably just turned everything else up. Right, then, right. It, it was just on after that. I can't remember a song by song thing, but they just totally annihilated. They played, um, I didn't think they would play it, and they did play it, Tora Tora and Lost Control. Right, right. That was so badass. <clears throat> they played the hits, and um, dude, the whole time they had the crowd just in the palm of their hands. It never let up. Like, right. you know, you go to a show these days, it could be Pink Floyd, it could be whoever. They're still like, it doesn't hold you the whole time. Or right, it's right. rare that it does. You know what right. I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. They had us the whole time until they were done with this after <laughs> the last song. And then they were just like, oh, yeah. Right. You know? And uh, they were gone. Wow. It was the baddest ass show, man. I'd never seen a show like that before. Never seen her sound like that. And, you know, never heard playing like that. When Eddie did his solo, it's when he had started doing the running back and forth and sliding with the knee pads and stuff. Yeah. It was so badass, man. He jump up against the amps and come back down. His playing was amazing. It was just, you know, a lot of the stuff he would play off the cuff, too. You right. weren't really sticking to set solos or anything. So it was super cool. Yeah, so so you uh, con contrasting the the two the two shows seventy eight and eighty, how did it did it feel like they were tighter or or oh yeah more developed definitely so as amazing as they were in nineteen seventy eight in nineteen eighty knowing what I know now being a musician about playing they've been on the road constantly for two right. years right right they were just super tight everything was dialed they were in command of everything there you know there was no pa issues there was no monitor issues everything was timed perfectly it was just a perfect show man and um everything sounded killer you know I, that show i started realizing how awesome a drummer alex was right you know yeah yeah and um how awesome Michael Anthony's vocals were, you know, and Dave, I love Dave, man, his yeah. showmanship. And back then he was singing a lot better than he does these days. Right. Sure. Yeah. Sure. sure. Yeah. I, mean, I saw him in Nashville in 2012. <coughs> Dave, he was fine. You know, a little pitchy here and there, just older, but he was still putting the show on. But back then, man, they were just fierce. Nobody could touch them. Right. Yeah. So they had definitely, these weren't the, the kids that opened for Black Sabbath, the hot kids, new kids on the block. These were dudes that were in charge, knew what they were, and were taking it to the nth degree. You know what I mean? Yeah. So putting you on, put it on this kind of show above and beyond what anybody expected. So they had done 10,000 hours between the time you saw them in 78 and yeah, man, man. right. I mean, you know, yeah. they were constantly on tour that, and they came to, came to my hometown in Birmingham twice that, that tour 78. Oh, yeah. So they had done two shows in Birmingham, different with a year apart, 11 months apart. So they were I all found out later they played in Nashville at War Memorial Auditorium in 78. I didn't even know they were there. They opened for journey. You know? Right. Right, that's right. how out of touch. That's how not in the loop anybody was back then. Right, right. Well, yeah, you couldn't be because there just wasn't any way to know. Yeah, yeah. So, so you do go to Fair Warning eighty one. Yes, I did. Um, just you know, we touched on this a little bit, but just from a, you, you weren't as close to see it up close, but did they still feel like the eighty version, or they was it any? No, and. I hate to even say this because yeah. I'm a, I'm a Van Halen. I mean, through and through, you know that. Sure. But I was way far back and they opened with on fire again and mm -hmm. it just didn't sound right where I was sitting. Okay. Plus I was with this girl who was just, man, she was not in a good place that night and it was really messing with my vibe. I wanted to be down front. She was like, no, we're not going to be in all the people. We got, you know, right. Right. And, I, you know, I was like, all right. So we were way far back 
in um, the sound just from where I was sitting, it probably would have, it was probably great down front because people were going crazy. Right. But way back in the back up high, I mean, this full auditorium, didn't, yeah. it didn't hit me the same. Yeah. So I was that super is, bummed about that. Yeah, that is a bold, kind of a weird, I've only been there once. It was a few years mm -hmm. ago from Judas Priest when uh, Faulkner and them. Oh, yeah. They yeah. came through and they played. And uh, I, so that was the first experience I ever had inside there. Mm -hmm. Kind of a kind of a different kind of shape and yeah, the, the whole it's thing. an old bowl, man, and yeah. nothing ever. The only thing that ever sounded good to me in there is probably because I'd smoked a bunch of weed. Right, Ted Nugent. The night they recorded that live album. Oh yeah. Um, I was back there. He cut through, but for some reason that night they may have just had an off night, or the sound guy might not have been happening, or it could have just been where we were. Right, right. Um, but Ed's guitar wasn't Ed's guitar that I was used to. It was right. kind of high endy, and uh, I was missing that low end and that that punch. Right, right. So, so probably just a, a fluke, but yeah. the crowd seemed totally into it. And by that time, you know, they were still kings of the hill. Right, right. You know, so and it was good. Don't get, don't get me wrong. It, but yeah, after you saw those, you on. saw those. Yeah, you 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 get you. Yeah. Been, baptized in the the, the super fire <laughs> yeah plus i was up so close right? right we had everything coming off the stage and the pa on each side and those long throw pas back then yeah right probably mostly what we were hearing was coming off the stage in the monitors yeah, and just yeah. vocals to the pa yeah you know that is that that is an interesting point about the, the the sound back then i think you know for me and you probably our thing to get up front was to see the see the players yeah. see, their, see their hands right that's yeah. why we not only that but for me it was the impact of seeing it so close yeah you know? i wanted to see the gear too i was just totally into all of it man yeah so we're all running to yeah. the front <laughs> yeah. we're those guys <laughs> one thing i do remember from the 1980 valerie bertinelli was there yeah. she was on side stage eddie kept going over this was the 1980 invasion he kept going over and uh, doing something with her. <laughs> <laughs> they were up to something over there on the side stage, and he'd come back out and just boom. He was showing a, he, off for his future wife. He, he was a god, man. Yeah, man. He was totally a god. So, 84, you did, did you see 84, you said, or not? No. Okay, no. I think in 84, I think our band was actually playing somewhere out of town or something. Okay. I didn't get to go to that show. Yeah, I saw it in Birmingham. And, yeah. then, and it was my first show with Van Halen. It was, you know, that's a good one. It was, it was epic. You know, I was 16 yeah. at the time. And, Were and you up close? I was down on his side pretty close on, yeah. on, on in the seats. But, but yeah, you know, I never even realized because when I moved from uh, where I, one of the towns I grew up in, Columbia, South Carolina, they had all general admission. Now, they, didn't, they never had general admission. It was always reserved seating. Oh, yeah. So as a kid, all the shows I went to, with my uncle were, were reserved seating. I didn't know there was such a thing as general admission until I got to Birmingham one night and Billy Squire was playing. And I asked us, you where can I sit? And he goes, wherever you want. And I was like, what? I know where I'm going. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that was like one of those things where it just impacted me differently. And then I went, yeah. and I kept wanting to be close. Like, you know, always fun fight your way towards the front. Right, right. We did that. We saw Iron Maiden in uh, on the Number of the Beast tour, opening for 38 Special in wow. Westboro Auditorium. Wow. That was easy to get to the front on that one. We had our leather jackets on. We're just like, get out of our way. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great tour to see. I saw yeah. uh, 85 Power Slave. Yeah, that was a good one. I saw yeah, that one. That's, that was one of their big tours. Yeah. yeah. So I so, saw Van Halen with Sammy a few times too. Yeah. Freaking awesome. Yeah, so you said Starwood. And with Gary. You said, yeah. you said Starwood. Starwood Amphitheater. So probably 92 or for Unlawful Chrono Knowledge Tour? Mm, or 95? 95? Balance? I don't remember. Yeah. By this time, he wasn't playing keyboards on stage. It was all programmed. He, I do remember him knocking one of the OBAs off the stand and him and Sammy just laughing about it. I guess they had a backup up there too, but he was playing and just kind of Ran into it, fell backwards, and the yeah. keyboard That's, went tumbling. That was probably 5150 because they still had them on stage then. Yeah. Yeah. May have been. 
Yes, 86, yep. 86, yeah. So, man, that is amazing stuff, those those stories, man. I, oh, man. Just, if you, if, you know, let's, I, you know, this is kind of a, a rough subject for us because when he passed recently, man, mm. I don't know if you, you were like me, but I got a thousand messages from people asking. Oh, yeah. Him. Everybody was like, I'm thinking about you, dude. They knew how much I loved Edward Van Halen. Yeah, I mean, but that's, you know, that is such a rarity. Uh, I I, I know, you know, people love Prince and people loved uh, Michael Jackson and, and, and all these icons. Mm-hmm. But for our community, for guitar players, man, that was our, you know. Yeah, he was, he was the man. He was the and, man. Um, you know, I hope somebody comes along and can do something for rock music, what he did. Right, right. And I say he, I mean, I love David Lee Roth, Alex, Michael Anthony, but it was Edward, man. He was the, the combustion, you know, of the engine. He was the fire, you know, he was the flame that made it all happen. Yeah. Those songs, man, those riffs. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and the impact, you know, from a, from a gear standpoint for, for us, you know, one of the things that's really interesting is that I saw when, he, after he passed, they put you a, a, a special door on your, yeah you know, on your domain. Tell, tell, tell about that a little bit. I wish I had, a, I do have a picture of it on my yeah. phone, but, um, so I'll find, I'll find we had it. a couple of girls, we had a couple of girls who are artists that work at the studio and, um, they were painting doors that we were going to have a theme because there's all these doors on the outside of Blackbird. There's like 10 different rooms there and yeah. different, uh, types of overdove rooms, big rooms, tracking rooms, and all these outside doors. So they did a couple of Beatles lyrics on one. They did another one with a, uh, like a sunrise coming up, really cool colors and stuff. It says, here comes the sun. And then uh, as a joke, one day I said, man, we need to get a Van Halen door. And the (laughs) next day McBride sent them over to ask me what I wanted on that our door. And it's like one of the main doors on the, the main drag, Barry, uh, Barry Hill. Bransford Avenue that runs through Barry Hill. Yeah. Here it is. I'm standing in front of it with my shark. Yeah. Awesome, dude. Did you see that? <laughs> That's a killer job they did. They painted a door. They did a great job, man. Look People come by. And get their pictures taken with it and stuff. It's great. I saw Damon every day. I show up to work. Oh yeah, Damon's Damon. Damon was there. Yeah, he came by. Yeah, so he's going to be on the next episode of this. So he's yeah. got a good first tour story, man. <laughs> yeah, he, we were. He came over. It was wasn't too long after Ed died, and he was doing a session there, and he came in to talk to me because I guitar tech for him on the Black Star Riders record, and okay. met him a couple times before. And we were both crying in there, man. That's how right. much it meant to us. Right, and right. That's how much Ed meant to us. Yeah. That, you know, like, right. If somebody would have walked into my office then, they're like, oh, what's going on here? Right, right. <laughs> Talking so, about Eddie, man. Right, right. I, I can yeah. imagine because, you know, that, that you know, October 6th, man, we will not forget that. that was, Never. I mean, you know, we, we all kind of knew that he was he was struggling. But man, yeah, it was still kind of shock because the rumors that I'd heard going around was he was getting beaten it. So they kept it pretty quiet. Same thing with like Neil Peart, man. Yeah. Two of my biggest influences. Yeah, who knew? Right? Yeah. yeah. Neil Peart was a, was just the, the drum equivalent, man. He was a, yes. You know, we, we played the lyric couple, equivalent. Yeah. Right. Right. We played yeah. a couple of other songs yeah. that, you know, that night that he put that week he passed, you know, cause we just had to, man. He was a guy. Yeah. yeah. Those guys were incredible, man. Well, I appreciate you being my first guest on Van Halen Stories, man. Dude, thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah, we're definitely kindred spirits. And uh, I'm, yeah. anytime there's the topic is Van Halen, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, we might we might get back together. I've got some other ideas that I, I'd love to do, you know, with some of the folks that I've interfaced with. Steve Brown is a big fan, you know, from Trixie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and Steve's been on, and then uh, of course D- Damon has some great stories, and uh, Greg Renoff, who wrote the book on Van Halen, yep. 
that that first love year. that book great book right and you wrote the yeah. Ted Gettleman book which is out and that's a another great look at all that you know i gotta get that i've heard, i've read x ex, excerpts but i have to get that i'm gonna very, get that this week very very good you know his viewpoint is very you know it's awesome one of the things i was going to say too about that production team with uh with uh since we're you know since blackbird is such an icon in that um that first album and the production on that album you know one of the things i was thinking about i just listened to damon's new album battle lessons mm -hmm. And, and, and yeah, and being and being there when he was young, and being in those clubs when he was young, it reminds me of how Van Halen captured their live essence on those first, especially yeah. the first, especially the first album. So you were there live in person, and you heard the first album, pretty close. Absolutely, that was the, the next week. I couldn't find the record anywhere to buy it the, those first few days. I went over to a buddy's house after school or we skipped school because he had the record. His parents were going to be gone. We mm -hmm. could listen to it at his house, Kelvin's house. And me and Joey went over specifically to listen to an album. Does that ever happen anymore? All right. No. I mean, and we were excited, man. And when the record came on, it was almost like seeing the show again. But now you could play it over and over, you know, <laughs> right. But yeah, it was, it was then. And that, I love that. Yeah. Because if that record would have been overproduced or, you know, had a bunch of bullshit on it, that would have been a bummer. Right. It was just it, like the show. That was, was one of their strong points, man. Yeah. I think that, you know, one of the things that as a person who's recorded their original music and I know you've done the same, is you're always trying to get whatever is coming to that mic or to match what you hear. Yes. You know, and that, yeah. and that seems like the elusive animal. <laughs> to, it to, is. To get him in that, get him in your box and make him still come out <laughs> the speakers sounding like what you heard. Right. Dude, right. I have one sound that I love and it's basically the Brown sound. Yeah. I can almost make any amp I can get there. That's right. what I always want to hear, man. Right. Doesn't right. matter what I'm using, you know. Right. That's usually where it ends up. And my brother will even go, man, well, why'd you even try to play through this sand? Why don't you just bring yours? It sounds exactly the same. <laughs> exactly. I was telling somebody, you know, I could get whatever rig. It didn't matter which amp, which modeler, whatever. Yeah. I'm going to end up sounding like Van Halen 1. <laughs> I know, dude. That's it. I that's where I'm going, man. It's the Holy Grail, man. Right. Wow. That's I've been amazing. messing with the Kemper because we're doing a bunch of those at the studio. Mm -hmm. And I can make almost every profile sound like Van Halen if I want to. Right. Because you yeah. dialed in on it, man. That's all we've been doing. Yeah, our lives, chasing that sound and chasing that. It's that, that how he how he created a sound that's the sound in our heads. Yeah. We've been chasing. We chased his yep. sound the entire time. It's just amazing. It's because it's so good. It's it just is. so organic and so just everything about it's great. Yeah, man, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to keep you all night. I could, but. <laughs> but Dude, I really, we'll do it again. Yeah, I really appreciate it, man. I'll get back in touch with you and do something special with uh, maybe some other folks and have a round table or something. That'd be cool. cool, brother. Let's do that. That sounds like fun. Yeah, well, give uh, Karma my regards. and I will. And uh, I'll come up there and see you at some point in, in person, and we'll hang out. Yeah, dude. We'll play go some, get some hot chicken or something. All right, play some guitars. All right, brother. <laughs> all right, man. I'll put this up and let you know. Cool. Let me know. I'll all share right, it. Thank you so all much, right, man. Bro.